Welcome to the second example video for chapter three. And this is the first out of a full set of projectile motion videos, um, examples. And all of the remaining examples from the chapter are from section 3.4, projectile motion. We're gonna make sure that we understand how the problem solving process that we learned back in chapter two is still applicable for problems from chapter three. Both of these chapters involve kinematics, and the big difference from chapter two to chapter three is that we're now thinking in two dimensions, and we have to be really careful about X and Y in our problems. So we look at the problem, and the very first step that we did back in chapter two, and we'll continue to do in these projectile motion problems, is to draw a picture as we go. So this is labeled as step one out of our normal step um, process. Okay, so Bailey kicks a soccer ball from the ground. So we have the ground, we have a soccer ball, and the initial velocity is 25 meters per second at an angle. So this angle, 30 degrees, the initial velocity is 25 meters per second. And in our step two of writing down uh, the given information, we actually right away need to break that up into components. We talked about that in the first part of the chapter, and if you haven't written it in your notes already, it is really essential that we write down any time we see a vector at an angle, we break it up into x and y coordinates, because we need the initial velocity in the x direction separate from the initial velocity in the y direction. So the initial velocity in the x direction, using our small amount of trigonometry that we've introduced here, would be the 25 meters per second, the hypotenuse, times the cosine of 30 degrees. And the initial velocity in the y direction, v not y, would be 25 sine 30 degrees. We need to use those because we cannot just put 25 by itself into our chapter three equations. They are either X equations or Y equations, and we must break this into components. What you'll notice so far is I haven't even finished reading the problem out loud, and this is really what you should be doing when you are problem solving. If you read the whole problem without writing anything on your page, you're gonna overwhelm yourself and once we get into that head state, it's really hard to get ourselves out of it. So, so go through the step-by-step -step problem solving process as you go along, because it means you're always taking one step forward until eventually you get to a point where you feel like you might be stuck, but you've made a lot of progress and we give a lot of partial credit in this class because we're trying to build these problem solving skills. All right, so we can put these into our calculator. So 25 cosine 30 degrees, is 21.65 meters per second. And 25 sine 30 degrees is 12.5 meters per second. We'll be using those soon. All right. The other thing that we have as a starting point is because we started at the ground, our initial Y value is zero. And because we are only going to be moving further away from this point in the x in the x direction we can also say that we're starting at some 0.0, .0 meters and we'll be counting up in distance from there all right so here's part a specifically and step three is to rephrase the question so step three we want to rephrase the question using the same process we learned in chapter two. Find blank when blank. We're being asked here to find the time, so that's find t, when the ball hits the ground. The ground is specifically y at the end of the problem has to equal zero, zero meters. Now, if we think back to chapter two, the reason why we train ourselves to rephrase the question like this is so that we're never asking ourselves what equation should we use. We hear students from all over 
uh, in physics say that the problem that they have is they don't know what equation to use. And that should not be the sticking point if we are using this problem solving process. This tells us the name of the tool. When we have a nail, we know we need to pick up a hammer. If we have a screw, we know we need a screwdriver. If we have the blanks filled in with Y and T, that tells us to use the YT equation. And that's labeled for us when we're looking for it in our notes. So step four is to write down the actual equation without numbers in it yet. So the yt equation we can look up. We don't have to memorize. But remember to use the chapter two version of it. There were those small changes between chapter two and chapter three including the fact that we only care about the y component of the initial velocity and that the acceleration we've already decided is negative and the value is 9.8. So step five is plugging in the numbers. We have our final location is zero. From our list of given information, our starting location was zero. From that list above, we broke this up into components already. 12.5 times t minus one half times 9.8 times t squared. All right, so we can clean this up a little bit. Zero equals 12.5 t minus 4.9 t squared. We do not have to use the quadratic formula at this point. What we do need to do, though, is factor a t out of the equation. So we have zero equals t on the outside times, in parentheses, 12.5 minus 4.9 t. Now mathematically, the reason why this t came out is because the ball was at the ground at the start of the problem. t equals zero is a mathematical answer to this equation. But it's not the time when the ball hits the ground after having been in the air. So what we care about, we can divide both sides by t, and what we're really solving is 0 equals 12.5 minus 4.9 t. We can add 4.9 t to both sides. So now it's on the left. 4.9 t equals 12.5. We can divide both sides by 4.9 right near the bottom here. And so our answer is 2.55 seconds. It's in the air for a couple of seconds. And our step six of does this make sense? So step six, we're always checking for sense. If we kick the ball into the air, we don't expect it to be in the air for tens of seconds. That would make watching a soccer game really interesting. <laughs> and it's also in the air for at least a little bit. You can follow the arc of a soccer ball kicked really hard through the air. So it's not going to be a tiny fraction of a second. That's all we're trying to do in these kinds of situations is make sure that the answer hasn't gone really awry or off the rails uh, because of something that we did either in the setup or the calculation. Now, part B of this problem, we have to go through our problem solving process again. It's the same picture and it's the same given information at the start of the problem. So we start back up in step three of rephrasing the question. In part B, we are asking to find blank when blank. So we are asking for the distance. Because we've landed on the ground, what we're looking for is the horizontal distance x, because we know that we haven't changed any vertical height um, from the start to the finish. And when it lands, although that does mean y equals zero, there is no xy equation. The only thing that links x and y information is t, and we've just found that t is going to equal 2.55 seconds when the ball lands. So this is telling us to use the xt equation So we'll write that out. Use xt equation. 
And again, this is never meant to be a guessing game of what equation we use. That's why we go through that problem solving step. So step four is to write out the equation before we've done anything to it. And it's the chapter three version of it. So there is no acceleration in the horizontal direction and we only care about the x component of that initial velocity. Step five, we plug in numbers. x is what we're looking for. We started at zero, plus 21.65 times the t is 2.55. So our result is x equals 55.2 meters. You could round that to 55 meters, no problem. And our step six check of does this make sense? If we think about 55 meters, that's a portion of a football field or soccer field. And so that seems reasonable enough. Bailey kicked pretty hard, and so it will go a significant distance, but we're not talking about miles or anything. So that would be a yes, it does make sense. One thing to point out between this example and all of the ones that you're going to see moving forward, we use the same problem solving steps from chapter two. If in your homework you're skipping all of the setup, that's not useful to you as a learner of this problem solving. And we want to make sure we recognize that it's not wasted time to do this setup. This is the correct and complete way to solve physics problems. And if the only thing on your page is just here, x equals 0 plus 21.65 times 2.55, that's useless to future you. When you're studying this in a month or two, preparing for the test or the final exam, or both, you want to have your work actually be meaningful and helpful to you. And so putting in the time to do the setup is not only good for your grade on assignments, Partial credit goes a long way if something just accidentally gets um, put into your calculator wrong. But also it's helpful to future you as you're studying. It becomes useful work that you've put in as preparation for those tests and final exams. So always go through as much setup as you possibly can. Always draw a picture. I will see you in um, many, many other examples for projectile motion. Bye for now.